brutal yet beautiful cross of Christ. Shed your blood and gave up your life that we might have life. What an amazing exchange it was, Lord. I can't fathom why you would do that, but I certainly rejoice in it as we all do. It's the cross that brings us all together here, back into relationship with you. It's the cross that brings us back into relationship with one another. Help us to never, ever forget about that beautiful exchange. Our mountain of sin, we bring you nothing good. And you give us everything. So undeserving we are yet so gracious you are. Awesome. We thank you, Lord. Here we are again, Lord, so we're asking that you do the supernatural, that the God that we cannot see would speak to us. Use this time, Lord, to advance your kingdom in us. Help us to have a greater understanding of who you are, what you desire. Give us the ability to do it, to not just be hearers of your word, but to be doers. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, loved ones, I certainly appreciate you making the good choice to come to God's house and uh, worship with other in the family of God, sing his songs and read his word. And uh, I don't know, could you maybe turn down this bass behind me? That's what I'm hearing. Thanks, man. It's super loud. You know how to do that? There we go. Well, it's a little bit better. It's still super loud, but I'm a loud mouth and I don't want to blow my own ears out. I'll try to reserve that for you guys. Do me a favor and grab a copy of God's Word and turn to 1 John chapter 2. And we're going to mine out some gems out of chapter 2, uh, verses 7 through 11. And then also, can you turn it down some more, please? And then also verses uh, 15 through 17. I don't know where all that, it's probably coming from this thing. Is it from this thing? I don't know if it's from that thing or not, but it's super, super loud. <clears throat> Super, super loud. 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 Super. There we go. All right. Working it out. Y'all hear me? All right, cool. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, my ears are bleeding, dude. All right, so we're going to study that, and uh, we're going to continue in our message series called Need to Know, and, and uh, John the Apostle, he wrote this, this short but powerful book, uh, telling believers not how to get saved, really, because they're believers already. So he's talking about some situations that could creep up, and we want to know if we're saved. We never want to just walk through life guessing, wondering, hoping, fearing. That's just really not the way he wants us to live. He wants us to know, right? He wants us to know if we're saved. And so he wrote this book for that reason. And, uh, man, we're having all kinds of stuff going on here. My microphone's cutting in and out. I don't know. We're going to get through it. Um, so as we study through that, I want to, um, as you're turning there, I just want to say that um, there's, there's lots of places in Scripture where um, you see imagery, like um, things like uh, run the race. How, how do we run the race with endurance that God set before us? Well, we understand that we're not like running a race, like we're not literally strapping on our sneakers and, and, and racing, uh, looking for the finish line. It illustrates um, a, a, a life. How do, we, how do we run this life? How do we finish this life with endurance by, by fixing our eyes on Christ? And then, you know, things like Jesus saying, um, I'm the gate, and those who come in through me, um, they'll be saved. Well, He's not a gate. He doesn't have a handle on him. He doesn't have hinges on him. Um, I'm really loud, man. What's going on? 
like super, super loud. It's like piercing my ears. Is it, is it super loud out there? I don't know what's coming through. It's just crushing me. I don't know what it is, but it's super distracting. But it's not bad? All right. Well, um, I don't know what, what, what's so noisy, but it's super, super loud. But I'll try to get through that. Uh, but there's all kinds of imagery in the Bible, and he's, like I said, he's not a gate, but he uses these, you know, God's Word uses these descriptions to try to help us to, to grasp some realities. And so, like, here's another one here. It's, it's about light and dark. So we use the words light and dark, like, for instance, Colossians 1, 12 through 14, it says, God the Father has enabled you to share in, in the inheritance that belongs to his people who live in the light. First of all, I just want to point this out. Um, this is not the main point of, of mentioning this verse, but he used the word enabled. Like, um, he's not determining, he's not deciding, he's not telling you and ordering you that you're going to. He's enabled you to make that choice. He's given you the opportunity to do that, okay? Um, and that means some will, some won't, but he's enabled you if, 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 right? If you've accepted Jesus, he's enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to his people who live in the light. For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son, Jesus, uh, who purchased, this is going to be a great place for an amen, okay? Uh, who purchased our freedom with his blood and forgave our sin. Amen. Okay, that's good news for everybody who's, who's uh, said yes to Jesus Christ. Now, that's the Apostle Paul talking about light and dark and these two different kingdoms where someone reigns in a kingdom and there's an atmosphere there and those two kingdoms are a little bit different, I would say. And so he says that. And then also Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, a very similar idea, but it's a lot shorter version of what Paul says. And Peter says, uh, For God has called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. And, and um, darkness is, here's, the, here's the, this word, make me sound like I'm smart. Uh, darkness is the word uh, skotos, and it, is, it means uh, shadiness. It means shadows. It, it means obscurity. Okay, and that's, that's the kingdom that the devil runs, and that's what we live in. We live in the shadows, and we live in obscurity, and we don't amount to much when we're in that kind of uh, kingdom. But then uh, when we get transferred into the kingdom of light, it's the word uh, fotidzo, and it means to shine. It means uh, to enlighten, uh, to illuminate, to make, to make me see. Okay, and so darkness... Is, is, a, is a bad kingdom. And darkness is where, there's, where fear and worry exist and uncertainty and death and the grave and, and the sense of obscurity. In, in other words, I'm worthless. I'm, I'm not really important. I'm in the shadows of things and I'm not really living. I'm just kind of existing, but I'm not very important to anybody, including myself. And so he transfers us into the kingdom of light. And that means... Uh, because he's shined upon us and he's enlightened us and we are able to uh, be illuminated and made to see. We're able to see who he really is and we're able to see who we really are and we can see his infinite value and, and the value that, you, that God has uh, placed upon you and, and you're not just existing but you're actually alive, right? And you changed your purpose and before the things that you used to live for which amounted to nothing... Uh, now you have a different purpose. You understand that you live for a king, and you live for a kingdom to be advanced, and that's the purpose of your life, okay? This is what happens in this transfer from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And, and Jesus, he expands upon that. He gives us some further clarity and meaning on what is happening during this transfer. John 5, 24, Jesus says, you've passed from death to life. See, these are the terms in the Bible that are used to describe what you're saved from and what you're saved to. You're saved from darkness and death, and you're saved to light and life. And so if you've acknowledged your sin, your own personal sin, and you've received God's singular provision for the forgiveness of that sin, which is accepting his perfect son, Jesus Christ, in whom all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in a human body. If you've accepted him as your Lord and Messiah, then you have been moved, you've been transferred from death to life 
from darkness into God's marvelous, wonderful light. Okay, That's what being saved is. And so when you hear Christians talk about, uh, are you saved? Do you want to get saved? That's what we're talking about. You've been, your, your existence has been shifted completely. You're not under the rule and reign of a dark kingdom where you don't matter and you really don't understand why you even exist. And it's run by evil and bad motives and bad priorities and, and an evil king. And now you're into this new kingdom where it's good. Okay. Now listen. If you've been saved, that's your reality, but I also need to make sure that you understand that just because you bent the knee to Jesus, he went to the cross, and, and he paid for your sin, that's awesome, but darkness still exists. Okay, it's not the end of darkness, okay? You've been, you moved, but that kingdom's still there, okay? Darkness still lives. Evil is still very, very present. It's right next door to you right now, okay? Okay. Um, the devil is still trying to steal, kill, and destroy. Now, you've been moved. You're not under his reign anymore, right? He really has no right or authority over you. But don't think for a second that you've graduated and you're above it and beyond it and I, he can't touch me and, because that's arrogance and you're setting yourself up for a problem, okay? Uh, 1 Peter 5.8 says, stay alert. Why, why, would he, why would the Bible say that if, if, if evil is dead, if you've been transferred into an um, untouchable place? Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Listen, the enemy is not coming sly and sneaky and quiet and discreet. He's like, I'm coming after you. Here's the temptation. Look at this. He's not trying to hide in the weeds. He's coming after you. And he's not shy about it. He's a roaring lion, right? He's not trying to sneak up in the, in the weeds or in the reeds. Like you see those, those movies from Africa where the big cats are kind of sneaking up on the gazelle or something. Yeah, not the lion. The lion's roaring. Here I come. I'm coming to get you. And that's why it says stay alert. Watch out. Because he's coming. He's coming. And so we've never really been delivered from that. But listen, by God's grace and your will. In other words, he offered salvation. You received and accepted that salvation. And because of that reality, darkness isn't where you live anymore. And that's awesome. But John's intention in this letter in 1 John is to point out that, to the reader that revisiting old places getting sucked back into the kingdom of darkness, look it, it's right here. It's, it's always available. It's right at your front door. It's coming, and he's not shy about it, okay? So don't think that when you went to the, down the aisle one day and you gave your life to Christ that it's going to be all unicorns and bunny rabbits, Okay? The enemy is coming after you and it's never going to be, it's never stopping until you draw your last breath. And you need to be made aware of that. Okay? Temptation is always there. It is always available and he would welcome you back to, be a, a, to, to, to betray your new king and to abandon your new kingdom and he would welcome you back into the kingdom of darkness with open arms. Okay, Just know that. So let's read here in 1 John chapter 2. Let's look at 7 through 11, okay? See what we're talking about here. He says, Dear friends, I'm not writing a new commandment for you. Rather, it's an old one you have, you've had from the beginning. This old commandment, to love one another, is the same message you heard before. Yet it is also new. Jesus lived the truth of this commandment. And you also are living it. For the darkness is disappearing and the true light is already shining. Okay, so first this. Um, some people in some churches will really teach this really false idea that there's, you know, there's the God of the Old Testament, you know, and, 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 and wars and smiting and, 
judgment and commands and laws and rules. And, and, and then there's the God of the, the New Testament. You know, there's the God of wrath over here. And that, but now this, it's the God of grace. And, and, it, and it used to be a God of justice, but now he's a God of love. And that's what people think and that's what people feel. But here's the thing. The book, right, the book that we use to tell us what our faith really is doesn't say that. The book that we use to describe what our faith is, so God has said, this is who I am. It says that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Right. He's not, he didn't used to be a God of wrath and now he's a God of love. Right? He's always been a God of wrath and a God of love. He still is the God of wrath and the God of love. Okay, Malachi uh, 3.6 says, I am the, this, should, this should sum it up for you. I am the Lord. I do not change. Okay? I do not change. The, so, so the same God that was on his throne when, when Joshua was leading Israel is the same God right now today. It's, it, he is, his character hasn't changed. His rules haven't changed. He hasn't changed. Nothing's changed. It's all the same. God has not changed, and his commands have not changed. But here's what has changed. What has changed, you see it there in the text. It says the true light is already shining. So what has changed is we've gone from centuries and centuries of, of there's God and there's people, and we're trying to obey him, right, and failing miserably, and, but, but along the way, he's promised that he's going to send his Messiah to come and be with you to actually help you with that disobedience, okay? And so that's what's happened here. Jesus has arrived. So that's what's really, that's the only thing that's really changed. The light, the true light is already shining. Let me explain what that means. Jesus said in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. If you follow me, and that's a big if, right? If you follow me, don't just say you believe in me. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness. Now you might. <laughs> you might say I'm yours. You might put a sticker on your car, but you might still be walking in darkness. He says, if you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness. I love that. That's kind of a choice right there, isn't it? He's not saying, listen, if you say yes, you're going to be good for the rest of your life. No, 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 that's not what he's saying. He says, if you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you'll have the light that leads to life. So earlier when I was talking about Colossians chapter 1 about you know, the, the people of God who could live in the light, okay, that wasn't speaking of a, of a state of mind. That wasn't speaking of a place like geography. No, the light was a person. It was Jesus Christ, the Lord. And so for those who are living in Christ, right? If you're in Christ, you're a new creation, right? Uh, John 15 talks about the, the vine and the branches and being in him, right? There's this idea that we're actually in Christ. We're like part of his, and it's kind of a supernatural thing. It's tough for our little brains to understand this. And I really don't understand it either, but we're, 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 we're the body of Christ. We're in Christ. Christ, so we don't just worship this faraway God and he's the king and we're over here. No, we're actually in him and he's in us. Like, that's kind of freaky, right? But it's just the truth of scripture. And so that's the, that's the reality, okay? So we're not living in a state of mind or a place. We're actually living in Jesus Christ. That is the light of the world. And so going back to our text, it says, this command to love, you know, not the old God versus the new God, okay? It's the same God, and nothing has changed. This command to love, love the Lord God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength. Love your neighbors, yourself, right? This is an Old Testament text that's being referred back to in the New Testament. It didn't, it didn't originate in the New Testament. It originated in the Old Testament, and then the people in the New Testament, right, Jesus, he's referring back to the Old Testament scriptures. And that's, and that's become a New Testament reality, and it's a reality for us today. Nothing, right, nothing's changed. Nothing has changed since way back in the Old Testament, into the New, into the present day. Nothing has changed. And so and John says, listen, Jesus lived this thing out. 
he lived it out. He loved, I mean, just there's that song from Hillsong about um, with this rugged cross or something. And it says, and he, he went to reconcile those who put the nails in him. Like, imagine the love that someone could have to, 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 to be tortured by a man and the reason why you're letting him torture you was so that you could forgive him. That is mind-blowing. And that's the reality of the cross. Jesus totally lived this thing out. And if you look at the text, it says that you're doing it too. Yet it's also new. Jesus lived the truth of this commandment and you also are living it. And so now, this see, Jesus has come. And because he came... And then he ascended. He sends his spirit to live inside of you. And so now, because his spirit is living inside of you, now you're doing it also. That's awesome. But there's a big but. But here's the very common pitfall. that, that This is why John's writing this letter, to, to identify these pitfalls for believers. See, here's, here's what happens. The, many saved, loving Living in Christ people fall into this one, okay? I love Jesus, but her? Right? I, I love Jesus, but, but I can't stand this guy. Guilty? Anyone? Like everyone in this room right now? Every single person. We're all guilty of it at one time or another. And listen, a moment of honesty from the pulpit. If I can't be honest, then you guys won't either. This is, there's lots of stuff in the Bible that I don't like. Let's just get that right out there. Right? I mean, on every page, I'm reading stuff that I don't like because he's telling me to do stuff I don't want to do. This has been one of the most difficult ones for me since I became a Christian. Former business partners that just stick it to you that you thought you could trust. Ministry partners. I can't tell you how many people have come into this church. Brother, I'm here because God sent me to help you. What, help me clean out half the church? Is that what, you sent, is that what he sent you for? Because that's the reality of it. Anyone have an ex that they're a huge fan of? I mean, th this is life, right? This is life. It's been a hard one for me, and I, my wife has had to really remind me of this often when my loose Massachusetts Boston mouth says I can't I hate that per I hate this you know and she's like really are you saved boom you know like yeah, thanks you know yeah I'm sorry you know see we don't we don't hate people because they were great to you you know we, we don't hate them because they were great we we hate them because they were terrible to you I mean, there's some legit things that people do to us. They're legit bad. Like, and, 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 and I'm, I'm not, I mean, I'm acknowledging that that's, and it's true. Like, I get that, right? There's, there's been some really rotten things that people have done to me, too. Like, there's some legit things that have happened in your life that people have done to you that are just awful, right? And so what do we do? We react. I mean, that's normal, right? It's natural to respond to what someone does. That's just what we all do. But what he's saying here is that Jesus lived out this love that even though people were doing bad to him, he loved him anyway. And he's like, and you're doing that same thing too, but, and then he hammers you. You're doing it, but what happens if you hate this person over here? You, I mean, you're loving them. It says that, it says that we were doing it, right? It says it. He says, you're, and you're doing it as well. But what happens if you drift there? And so his spirit is now in you. And so what he's saying is, listen, I want you to do differently. Don't, right? What does Paul say in, in, in Romans 12? Don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. So the way we think is, you've done this to me, I do this to you. But then Jesus comes along and spoils everybody's party all the time. And he's like, uh, did you ever hear the golden rule? See, the golden rule, nobody wants to hear that one. The golden rule is just so, it rubs against our grain. Nobody really wants to do that because what we do is we react to what people do. 
And I'm guilty of it too. So it's not like I graduated, but here's the truth of Scripture. Forget what I've said or what I've done. The truth is, he says, I want you to do to others what you want them to do to you. So see, your action comes first. See how he's flipped the switch on everybody? What we do is, you do something, I do it back. What Jesus is saying, I want you to do to them before they ever do to you, I want you to do to them the way you'd want them to do to you. See, he doesn't want us to react anymore. He wants us to choose to act. And that's what Christians are called to do. And the thing, you know, we talked about nothing's changed. This is the thing that really blows my mind. It says to do this, which nobody really wants to do. That's okay, but that's Jesus Christ, Matthew chapter 6, totally New Testament scripture. But, but what he says is in that verse is, I want you to do unto others what you want done to you. And the essence of all the law and the prophets, that's all Old Testament stuff. This God that we said was wrath and judgment and smiting and kill all those people because they're not mine. Jesus, the word, in the word, says that the golden rule is the essence of all the law and the prophets. All that stuff that we thought God was mean and he was a judge and he was a wrathful God and smiting and war and, and all this and the ten plagues and somehow that's love. But, but, but listen, while God's doing all that, in the same time he's saying love the Lord God with all your mind, heart, soul and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. A lot of the stuff in the Old Testament wouldn't happen if people would love the Lord God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength and love each other, it wouldn't have happened. So everyone wants to blame God that he's mean. No, no, let's look at ourselves. He's the king. He said do something and you didn't. Parents, come on, right? What happens? Spanking time, right? So God spanks. That doesn't mean he's... A, a, a nasty, ugly God. No, he's a just God. He said, do something, and you didn't. You get spanked. That's what happened. But nothing has changed. The golden rule is the S. This is the essence of all that is taught in the law. See, most churches think it's all grace and, and, and forgiveness and love and Holy Spirit flowing. And over here is the churches that are super legalistic and they're very, very conservative and they're all about the law. And, and, and what I think, and this is just me, I think they both come together beautifully. And I think it's a lack of spiritual maturity that makes people believe it's one or the other. It's one book, y'all, and it's one author. And so they have to jive. And if they don't jive, it's not God's mistake, it's yours. Right? It's one book. And if, he, if it's true, and I believe that it is, that I am the Lord and I do not change, then somehow... The Old Testament and the New Testament, they have to come together in a beautiful, beautiful harmony. And if it doesn't for you, you need to check your studies yourself. Okay. Now, um, I love this here. Look at verse 10. Um, okay, let's just go. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, let me keep reading. I'm sorry. Um, disappearing in the truth. True light is already shining. Uh, verse 9. If anyone claims I am living in the light but hates a Christian brother or sister, that person is still living in darkness. You see? See, so he's writing to save people, right? But yet he's saying, now listen, saved person, be careful. Because if, you know, 20 years later, after you've been saved and you've been loving on everybody, someone ticks you off and you're like, I hate that person. you got a problem. You're not like off the hook because you got saved. So be, everyone's saying, well, I went to the cross, he forgave my sins, past, present, and future. Okay, that's awesome teaching, except this. <laughs> what, what, what do you do with that? If it's already forgiven, why is he telling you, don't do it? It's a little problem there. And I think that's this easy gospel that gets preached. And you kind of get off the, lit off the hook here too easily. But he says, he says if, you, if you're a Christian, because that's who he's writing it to, uh, but you hate a Christian brother or sister, that person, the person who's hating, uh, living in darkness. Anyone who loves another person, uh, you know, a brother or a sister, is living in the light. They are living in the light. Okay, good. Living in the light. What is that? We already determined. Jesus said, I am the light of the world, right? 
They're living in the light. They're in Christ and does not cause others to stumble. But anyone who hates another brother or sister is still living and walking in darkness. Such a person does not know the way to go, having been blinded by the darkness. So you see there in verse 10, it's giving us evidence of real salvation. What does it say in verse 10? Anyone who loves another brother or sister is living in the light and does not cause others to stumble. So you understand here that living in the light is another way of saying this is persons in Christ. They're saved. Okay, we get this. And so this is evidence. If you're loving people, it's evidence that you are a believer. Okay, that's what I mean. I know it's kind of a, a, a broad brush statement, but we see that it's in there. That's what it says. And so loving others proves that salvation is real, but at the same time, hating other Christians proves that fellowship with God is has been broken. It just says right there that they're living in darkness, but it was written to believers. Okay, so there's a problem there. Okay, so what do we do? Because we've all been there. I mean, when I asked you, some people raised their hand. The rest of you kind of giggled, which is an admission of guilt, right? But what do we do? Because we're all guilty of that. Well, we go back to that main verse that we saw, our, our life verse as a Christian, 1 John 1, 9. If you confess your sin to him, Jesus, he is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. So it's at that point that your advocate, that your intercessor, he steps in and says, Father, yeah, that herb, man, <laughs> he did it again. You know, all the time, you know, but he's with me. All right, son, that's fine, you know. I'll take another, give me another whipping, Dad. You know, I'll take it for a herb, right? But this is kind of what's happening here. We lose fellowship with him, and we hate a brother or sister, but if we admit and we confess it, Jesus steps in again, okay? So love, so it's not like it's hopeless. And this is the constant uh, posture of the believer, the constant posture of the believer should be repentance. It's not something you do one time where you confess your sins to God at the altar and you say, that's it. The constant, ever-present posture of the believer is repentance. All throughout the Bible, whether it's Old Testament or New, it's been the same message. It's never changed. And it's to, to non-believers and to believers across the board, every person. What is it? Repent, 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 repent. It's never changed because God has never changed and it just seems like we haven't either. So we have to constantly be repenting. Now, loving people is evidence that you are living in truth, that you are living in the light, that you are living in Christ. Okay, that's how we know. That's how we know. Not that I go down the aisle. No, how do I know that I'm in Christ if I'm living in the light? I'm loving other brothers and sisters in Christ, okay? I'm loving them. Now, we get to this next section here. You see it there in, in the Bible, uh, verses 12 through uh, 14. I'm not going to read that because we covered that the first week we started into this series. It's kind of that weird section of the book where Paul, uh, I'm sorry, John is telling us some details, some pitfalls that we could fall into, and it kind of, sound, kind of sort of sounds evangelistic. And without these verses, 12 through 14, we would think, okay, this is an evangelistic book. He's writing it to people, hey, this is what you got to do to get saved. And so right there in the middle, after giving some details, he stops, and it just seems like it has no place there. But he says, hey, listen, by the way, I'm writing to those who are saved. I'm writing to believers, the ones who have conquered their, their fight against the enemy, whose sins have been forgiven through Jesus Christ. And so we're not going to uh, rehash that. But that section there, I don't want to just think that we're breezing right by it, but that's the part of the book where he says, listen, I'm writing this to believers. I'm writing this to saved people, okay? So here, here, here's another way that we know. That's the title of our series, right? We know uh, love for people. That's a yes, right? Check, check. Hopefully you're checked. Right? Um, love for stuff and experience is very bad. And that's a no. That's a no. And that's a very difficult subject to, to cross uh, here in America. All right? Uh, look, at, look, at, look at the text. Um, look at verse 15. He's telling, he's, he's just come off this section about that you have to love people. Okay? Love people, love people, love people. And, and just 
Can we just remove 12 through 14 for a second? Because that was kind of injected in. But you can see he's just kind of continued the thought of the end of verse 11, where he's talking about loving people, right? He says, but, but don't love this world, nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you, not, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and a pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father. Okay, they're from the world. Now, just clarity, okay? Clarity is, okay, the things that you crave after, those are from the Father. But the craving for it, that's not, okay? Because everything was made by Him, right? So the, he's not saying don't, don't enjoy these things. He, and he's saying that the world offers you a different perspective on those things. And that's where we need to adjust our thinking, right? Okay, the, these things are uh, they're from the world. They're not from the Father. And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. Okay. So... The no, this uh, bad, this uh, we're not saved thing is uh, described here in verse 15 as uh, you don't have the love of the Father in you. Now remember here, he's writing to believers. So if you're a believer, would you say, I mean, just, let's just vote right here. Let's have a committee vote. If, if you're a true, authentic believer in Jesus Christ do you believe that you'd have the love of the father in you is it possible to to be a true authentic heaven-bound believer in Jesus Christ and not have the love of his father in you I don't think it's possible either I don't think it's possible and so he describes this situation in that way there's lots of ways to say it but he says you won't have the father the love of the father in you this is clearly not the way that a heaven-bound citizen of glory would be described, right? How many people are going to be in heaven when we get there, around the throne forever, singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who don't have the love of the Father in them? None. And he's writing this to believers. So the danger is real when it comes to distraction. Okay, big time real. There's a massive, massive reality here about distraction from the love of God. He says, loving the things of the world. Here's the three things that are um, talked about here. They're listed. You can see them there. Um, physical pleasure. That's a massive distraction. Th these are our experiences. These are the things that we want to experience. I want to experience um, great travel. I want to experience great uh, liquor. I want to experience great sex. I want to experience great food. I want to experience great experiences, right? I just want to experience stuff, right? I want to, I want, I'm, we're hedonists. I want to, I want, and listen, it's okay to enjoy some things, but not to crave after that thing. Like, that shouldn't be the driving force of your life, okay, and then the next one is uh, lusting, depending on your translation, lusting or craving uh, after everything that we see. Okay, so if the first thing is, is seeking experience, right? The second one is having stuff. I see that, I want 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 that. I could do a little research, didn't do it, probably should have, on the amount of credit card debt we have in our country. Okay, that's what we're talking about here. Okay, driven driven, motivated to grab things that I see and I want all that. We are hedonist people. I want this. I need this. I, I want to feel it. I want to experience. I want to have it. And that's what the world would offer you. And the third one is this pride, this, the pride in possessions and achievements. That's just bragging about the first two things. right? Look what I've, look what I've done. Look what I have. Look at me. I'm awesome. It's just bragging on the first two things. Now listen, I'm not the crusty old pastor that's going to come up there and say, man, like, we should live off the grid, man. No, I'm not that granola guy. 
I'm not that guy at all. Okay, and I'm not a poverty gospel guy either. The, the, you know, a lot of people give the, the prosperity gospel guys a hard time, and I do too, but, but just as bad as the poverty gospel guys that say, you know, pastors and preachers and really Christians for that matter, we should all live in poverty. Give it all away, man. You shouldn't have anything. Okay, I'm not that guy either. What I am is a don't love stuff so much that it becomes the main thing in your life guy. That, that's, that's what I am, okay? 1 Timothy 6, 17 says, God richly provides us with everything to enjoy. <laughs> so, so all this stuff that we're craving after, I want this, I want this, because it'll feel good, man. If sex with one girl feels good, then why don't I have sex with 20 of them? Because that'd be 20 times better, right? If this meal is good, let's just ha have more. If this car is good, let's get a fancier one. If this house is good, let's get a bigger one. All these things like... That, that, that's not, that shouldn't be the driving force of our life, but he doesn't say we shouldn't enjoy the things that God gives, right? Every good and perfect gift comes down from above, but our pursuit of those things as the driving force of our life is bad. We're supposed to enjoy the stuff, but we're supposed to love the stuff source. Do you see the difference between the two? We're supposed to love God. Not love what God can give. We're supposed to love people. Not love what they can give, what they can offer you. Not what they can gift you, not the attaboy they give you, not seeking their praise, not seeking the glory of men in any way. Distraction's a big deal for the Christian. And it's an all too common one. And John is simply just teaching us this. Like, don't be distracted by these things. And I'm telling you, and you guys all, I am not picking on America, but man, it's tough here. You know, it's tough, to, it's tough for people in, in third world nations because they're trying to hold on to life. Yeah, we're not trying to hold on to life here, most of us. We all got it pretty good, even those in our, in our church right here, the least fortunate, we still have it pretty good. Some of us are wondering, you know, what we're going to eat tonight, like should we eat at this restaurant? Should we eat at that restaurant? And other people are wondering if I'm going to eat tonight. So it's a whole different problem here for us. One of our great problems here in the faith is our distractions. And so John is attacking this thing. And, he's, and you know, he's just he's reiterating what our Master Jesus taught us in the Gospels. In Ma Do me a favor, look in your Bible in Matthew chapter 13. Would you go there with me? This is a very, very famous, popular section of Scripture. Not everyone's going to agree with me here, but that's okay. That's all I would ask you to do is just consider the words of the Bible and make your choice based on that, not what I'm preaching. Do you guys understand? You don't hear that at churches too often, but it's true. Okay, I'm not the authority. That book in front of you is. I'm going to do what I can. So I'm going to read this with you. Very famous, sowing the seed. And so chapter 13, he says this. Um, <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. That was awesome timing. We couldn't have planned that out any better, right? That was so good. All right, so you guys there at Matthew 13? Okay, cool. And thank you for letting me do this. This is so cool. Um, listen, this is Jesus speaking. A farmer went out to plant some seeds. As he scattered them across the field, some seeds fell on the footpath, and the birds came and ate them. Other seeds fell on shallow soil with underlying rock. The seeds sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow. So, it, I mean, it did, it, it grew. But the plants soon wilted under the hot sun, and since they didn't have deep roots... They died. Other seeds fell among thorns. They grew up and choked out the tender plants, so there was life there too. Still other seeds fell on fertile soil, and they produced a crop that was 30, 60, and even 100 times as much as had been planted. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Okay, and then if you're like Jesus' disciples, you're like, yeah, I'm listening, but I don't understand, right? And Jesus knew that, and so he explains it. 
So if you jump over to verse 18, he starts to explain what it was. He says, now listen to the explanation of the parable about the farmer planting seeds. The seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message about the kingdom and don't understand it. Then the evil one comes and snatches away the seed that was planted in their hearts. Okay, so do you see? That person never got saved. Like the, 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 the preacher or the evangelist or he's reading the Bible, whatever, and you, and you hear it, right? And you hear it, but no life comes out of it. There is no regeneration. The seed in this one, like in the scripture it talks about that if, if a seed dies, then it can be new life. Okay, that's an illustration of salvation as well. In this first one, the seed never died. Do you see? It never got in and planted and got roots and actually new life was created. You see that there in the text, right? That's undeniable. That person never got saved at all. Okay? But now read on. Verse 20. The seed on the rocky soil... And, and can we just go back to remind ourselves what happened there? Other seeds fell on shallow soil with underlying rock. That's the rocky soil. The seeds sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow. But the plants soon wilted under the hot sun, and since they didn't have deep roots, they died. So it went from dead to life to dead. You see it there in the text? I'm not making it up. That's what it is. Okay, here's what Jesus says. The seed in the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. It got in. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. Did it say they never sprouted new life? Did it say there was never new life there? It said there was new life, but then it died. It went from dead to life to dead. It didn't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. So you see what happens here. Problems kill the progress. The, the word of God gets in. There's new life. It starts, yeah, Jesus, I love it. And they, and they believe it. It's not that they didn't believe it. It says that they believed it. They received it. There's new life. Awesome. But problems come. And see what happens is if you don't have deep enough roots then when problems come, you start doubting if this Jesus is real. Because you never really got into the word of God that said many of the afflictions of the righteous. You never got into the word of God that says, uh, in this life you will have trouble. <laughs> and you didn't get into the word where it says, don't be surprised by the fiery trials that you're facing. As if surprised. So you, ne you never got into that. And so you had this false idea of what was going to really happen. So when problems come, you're like, well I thought it was supposed to be this way, so forget about that. And that happens a lot. That's when problems and persecution come. It's like, man, I, sh man, I listen. Just some more, more honesty. When I, when my ex-wife left me, I remember sitting on my living room floor, fetal, crying, and cussing him out. I won't tell you what I said. I'll leave out the ugly things, but it was like, why would you do this to me? I, I've given my life to you. I'm a, I'm a pastor. I love you. I, I, I didn't have a full theology of, of suffering. I didn't understand that these things happen. You know what I'm saying? And so, praise God, I didn't run. I ran too. But I didn't know what else to do. I was hopeless. and <laughs> She wasn't coming back. I <laughs> wasn't going to run to her. Run to him. But if you don't have an understanding of the truth, and that's why I'm always pushing and pushing and pushing you to pursue greater and read and study and meditate, because if you don't, listen, life's coming. And if you're not ready to face life, you're going to be like this. And when problems come, you're going to die because you don't have a, a great enough understanding of truth. Okay? Let's go on. The seed, this is the third seed, the seed that fell among the thorns represents those who hear God's word. They hear it. 
But all too quickly, the message is crowded out by the worries of this life and the lure of wealth, so no fruit is produced. So it doesn't say that there wasn't new life. It's talking about fruit. There's a tree. The seed died. It got in. There's new life, right? There's new life. But look what happens here. The worries of life, the lore of wealth, boom, distraction. Jo Listen, John's just preaching the same thing that Jesus is preaching right here. This distraction can kill your progress. And we've got to be careful of all these things. Loving the things of this world, that's all he's saying right here. The worries of life, the lore of wealth, so no fruit is produced. See, problems and, and this desire, these distractions, they kill what God has created. He's dropped the seed in you and the new life has begun. And because you're not rooted and going after him, these things get in the way and the plant dies. It doesn't say that it wasn't alive. It says it was and then it died. The fourth one's the one I hope that all of you are. The, the word of God comes, the gospel's given, and you embrace it, and you believe it, and you get after him like there's no tomorrow, and he comes, becomes the passion of your life, and you produce much fruit for the kingdom of God. That's awesome. The character of Christ is being built in you. It's swelling up in you. He's using you to advance his kingdom. You're loving him. You're worshiping him. You're serving him. All of that. I hope that's you. All three things listed in our text in 1 John, though, are simply the gathering of things to ourself. That's all it is. Temporary pleasures. Temporary pleasures for our senses and for our egos that actually serve to push God off of the throne of your life. And you think that they're good for you. And he's saying, listen, I want you to enjoy things, but don't push me off the throne. Don't push me off the throne. Don't let these things be the major drive and motivation of your life. And let me tell you something. No one, he's writing to believers, right? No one in glory, no one in heaven will ever, ever have someone else on their throne except Jesus. Do you understand? It's a massive, big caution right here that John's giving you right now. Big caution flag, okay? Big. And that's why he says, only a very few find it. Only a very few find it. How many people have confessed that Jesus is their Lord? Uh, many. Billions. But Jesus says, contrary to your belief, very few find it. Listen, four seeds, three of them don't end up in heaven. That's scary. And, and two of them actually got in, created new life, and still died and didn't get to go. It's a big problem, and it's not to be taken lightly. And you should be standing guard and being alert and watching out because you're here in this country which is filled with distraction. There are people in this church that, look, being here tonight does not decide whether you're saved or not in any way, shape, or form. But there are more people that call this church home that are not here tonight than are. Why? I'll tell you why. It starts with a D. Distracted. Distracted. There should be no, listen, I'm just being honest, brutal honesty. There should be nothing more important in the life of the believer than to pursue Jesus Christ. Nothing. And I'm, t listen, I want to break the odds in this church with you guys. People are saying that the church model in buildings, all that, that, that thing is dead. And I say we tell them where to stick that. Seriously. I tell them we, I, I think that we should tell the devil where to stick that stat. Because I think that, that, there's a, that there, there's a great need to have a church that is packed with believers, encouraging one another, passionately worshiping Jesus Christ, going after him with their whole heart. That's what he wants, okay? And so, but instead we're distracted by other things. And I just tell you, beware of the trappings of this world. Flashing lights, fast cars, pretty girls, promotions with titles. I did this. I got that. Look at me. I'm awesome. You know, it's funny. I, uh, I got to, Carl invited me to his, his graduation, and he graduated from Lake Sumter just, uh, just the other day, just yesterday, wasn't it? Yeah. Awesome. 
going to have a little party here tomorrow after church if you guys want to come. If anybody else graduate this year from anything? First grade, second grade, kindergarten, high school, college, whatever. Anybody, if you have a relative you can bring, well, just a little, just a little gathering after church tomorrow just to celebrate that. So I was great, grateful that you invited me. I was happy to see that. You know, it's, fun. it's kind of fun. Can I tell you guys a story? It's kind of cool how God works things out. So yesterday, um, so my wife's going away for the weekend. She's going to be home actually late tonight, and I'm super excited to see her. Can't wait. And, um, but because she was going away, I switched my day off from Friday to Thursday because wasn't, she wasn't going to be here yesterday, and I figured I'll just work tomorrow. You know, I'll just work Friday instead of on Thursday. I'll hang out with her. So I hung out on Thursday, and then Friday came. But what I just didn't realize is that my wife really does a lot of stuff. She's carting kids back and forth from school, two different schools, twice a day, kids that don't even belong to us. She drives them to school, man. She's crazy out of her mind, okay? But, so, so I had to do all that stuff while she's gone, and it wasn't because Jameson and Jackson are away. Oh, you get the day off? No, because the kids that we don't even own, we have to still pick them too up. We have to pick them up too. So, to drive, so anyway, so I got to do all that stuff, plus do my normal full, days of work, full day of work, and like, she does a lot, and so... In the middle of all that was, was, was Carl's graduation, and I didn't want to miss that, so I go to the graduation, you know. So we get to the graduation, and man, <laughs> how many students? 500? Something like that? They came in. I mean, I'm like, you know, the whole time, I'm like, man, I got to get going. I'm, I, love, I love this guy, but like, I got to go. I got to go. They walked in like this. <laughs> With that staff thing, you know. It looked like darkness and evil, really. Everyone's in black robes. It was like the underworld. It was awful, you know, but I love you. And uh, so I'm sitting there, right, and they're just taking forever. And they don't get to, what's, I mean, we're all there to, to, to see. We don't really care about the other people. I mean, let's just be honest. I'm there to see him get his, his diploma, right? And so, 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 so they don't go right to that. So they have to, they have to announce all the distinguished panel members and all in their dark robes. It was like Darth Vader and Darth Maul and all the right. And so, so they introduce all them. And then this lady has to speak. And then this guy has to speak. And, and the president has to speak. And then we got to acknowledge the people that had a 4-0. And then we got to acknowledge the people that had a 3-5. And then we got to acknowledge, I mean, just everybody. Like it's been over an hour. We haven't even seen a single diploma yet. And I'm like, so I'm freaking out. Like, I, I love you. I love you. You gave me a ticket. I, I don't want to leave, but I'm like, I got to go. And I'm sitting there. This, I'm turmoil, turmoil. I'm like, they're going to hate me. I'm the worst pastor ever. Like, I got to go. I got the weekend. And then I get this gospel fest this morning. I had to preach that. So I had to have a whole other message ready for that. So two messages, bunch of kids driving back and forth. Carl's graduation. I don't know what to do. I got to get out of there. So finally I get up because I'm the worst friend ever. And I'm like, I love you and I love him, but I got to go. And, and of course, Kim is gracious to it's okay, man. It's okay. It's okay. So I get up and I leave. Back my chair out, sneak out the back, and I literally run. I know it's hard to believe that I ran. I ran to my car only to find out that I left my key. I parked a million miles away, that I had left my keys in the gym. So, of course, I tuck my tail between my legs, and I'm like, ugh. And I go back, and the moment I walk in the door, there's Carl getting his diploma. And I'm like, yeah! <laughs> it was, so, in that moment, I was a Calvinist, because God has ordained, and he made it happen. It was predetermined that I was going to see that. It was cool. But... Uh, it's funny, so then we're looking, we're on our hands and knees, there's no, and I guess my keys had fallen off my chair into her purse, into Kim's purse. So she's like, oh, these? I'm like, oh, yeah. Yeah. All that to say that I go to this graduation, and, and I'm up there, and, you know, they've got this lady, the CEO from Duke Energy, God bless her heart, but, man, she must have said every cliche ever invented. Things like this. Be proud of who you are. Do whatever, you can do whatever you decide if you set your mind to it. Trust in yourself and climb the corporate ladder. These are what we're taught. And they mean well. But they're evil in every single way. This is not who we're supposed to be. Paul says, if you want to boast, boast only in the Lord. I mean, Paul, 
There's no, I love you, bro, but there's no one like the Apostle Paul in all 500 of you. He had been sucked up to the third heaven, got direct revelation from Jesus Christ, the voice from heaven, why you persecute, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, and he wrote most of the New Testament, planted churches, like, guy's amazing. He had every reason to brag. He had every reason to trust in himself, very educated, wise man, permission from the authorities to be able to do what he was doing. Like, guy was awesome. And he's like, no, 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 no. You want to boast? Boast only about the Lord. L- listen, la- loving after all this other stuff is dangerous. It's very dangerous. And I love you, and I need you to know that. Now, Jesus talks about this again in the Bible. He says it to the people of Ephesus in the book of Revelation. And I would suggest strongly that he is saying it to you as well today. Would you go there in the book of Revelation? Say, ooh. Go to Revelation chapter 2. Almost done, guys. I feel like there's much preaching here tonight, just kind of teaching through this stuff. I hope that it's helping you. Hope it makes you think. So if we read in the Bible in in Revelation chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Well, let's just go, you know what, let's just go back a little bit. Let's look at verse 2. He's writing to 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 the church in Ephesus, and he's like, and Jesus is like, I know all the things you do. Like that's, first of all, that's encouraging and scary, right? That's encouraging and scary. Like Jesus Christ knows what you did today. You can't hide that. Right? He knows every single thing that you did. Okay? He says, I know all the things you do. He's writing to a, a group of people, a church, kind of like what we're in right now, just a group of people. He says, I've seen your hard work, so you're, you're serving diligently. That's good. Uh, your patient endurance, so like maybe things aren't going as well at the church as you'd like. Not as many people are getting saved. Maybe the finances aren't right up to snuff. But you know what? You've been patiently enduring. You're still working hard. You're still serving. You're still praying. You're still, you know, you're doing the right things. He says, I know you don't tolerate evil people. You've examined the claims of those who say they're apostles but are not. So we've, we, not only am I uh, serving correctly and continuing to serve, so I'm acting right, but I'm also, what? I'm believing right. There's a lot of people out there today that are calling themselves prophets and apostles. We need to do like they did. Like, just, you got know, to check out what they're saying here, man. Someone comes to you and says, uh, I'm a prophet. Uh, well, let's just, why don't you give me a prediction? Let's see if that thing comes true. And if it doesn't, step. Okay, so anyway, they're, they're, they're saying they're taking the truth and they're, they're saying, okay, this guy says he's an apostle, so he's teaching this, and, and I know the truth, and, and you examined what they said, and you found out that they're incorrect. So proper belief, proper serving, you've discovered uh, they're liars. You've patiently suffered for me without quitting. I mean, would you guys say that's a good church? That's a good church. For all, for all we can see, that's a good church. He's like, he's commending the church. Like, that's awesome. And then Jesus turns it and he says, but I do have this complaint against you. Yikes. You don't love me as you first did. You've, you've lost your first love, some Bibles would say. You've lost your first love. You, you didn't... You didn't um, It didn't kind of just move down on the list from first to second to third. No, you lost it. What does that mean? If you you lose your coffee cup, do you still have it but in less measure? No, you don't have it anymore. And Jesus is like, yeah, you're doing all the right things at your church, but your motivation, the reason why you're even meeting as a people is out the window. And he's not talking about Sequential, he's not talking about order because obviously you love things before you ever fell in love with Jesus. First love meaning the most important, first in rank and privilege, first on the list, first love. And he's like, you've lost your first love. So ministry has become your love, maybe. Maybe your church has become your love. Maybe serving me, maybe your spiritual gifting, whatever it may be, but you've lost your first love. Look what he says. He says, here's what we need to do to get back on track. 
If you've been distracted and he's not the, 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 the central focus and motivator and love of your life because you're, all of your resources are freely and frantically flowing towards stupid stuff that is not the Lord, he said, this is what you need to do. Look at how far you've fallen. So take a look back to what you used, where it used to be. How many people remember when they first got saved, man? Right? You didn't know anything about Jesus, but you like want to tell everyone about it, right? You were like the dumbest guy, the dumbest girl. You do nothing, right? You probably would have told them all the wrong stuff, but you just, you were so amazed that like you looked at your, your junk and you're like, and he loves me and he saved me. And you're like crying, the snot's coming out of your nose and, and, and tears are pouring and you're just like weeping like a little baby, you know? And, and you don't even know why. You know, I just love Jesus, you know? And you just want to tell everybody. I remember when I first got started, like that's how it's, it's kind of morphed into this. But when it first started, I just had church at work, you know? Like I just, I went to work and before I used to like, my, my day was driven by this great desire to lie and cheat so I could make a bunch of money. Because that's what car salesmen do. But all of a sudden, it shifted. And my motivation when I went to work wasn't to sell cars anymore. My boss didn't like that anymore. But now I just wanted to tell people about Jesus. I, I hadn't been discipled. I hadn't gone to seminary. I, I, just, I, just got, I just didn't care. I just wanted to tell people about Jesus. And, and so he's like, just remember where you've fallen. Just rem remember that. Remember when you just loved me? You were dumb as a rock, but you just loved me. Right? <laughs> The faith of a child, right? Just the faith of a child. Like, I don't even know, but I just love Jesus. Kids sing, Jesus loves me, this I know, even though they have no idea that he does. Because they just, they just know. He just loves them. And they love him. And they don't have theology behind it. They don't have, un, they don't have scripture undergirding their belief. They just do, right? And he says, remember how far you've fallen. And then he goes on, he says... Um, Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. He says, remember where you were? That's where I want you again. I, it, it doesn't mean put your Bible down and don't study. But I just want you to love me. You know, everything that happens in church, if you think about everything that's going on there, working hard, patient endurance, examining the text and examining the preacher and making sure it's proper theology and suffering for the Lord, all that stuff, all of that has to come from a place of, I love Jesus. That's it. You know, nobody likes the smart guy who went to seminary and has a master's in divinity, but he's a, just a jerk. Like, he, Jesus just wants you to, like, just fall in love with me. Like, if you fall in love with Jesus, you're going to have an amazing ministry. And God will use you for incredible things. He says, remember where you used to be? I want you to turn again. Just like you turned away, I want you to turn back to me and do the works you did at first. And he says, if you don't repent, <laughs> that's dangerous. But if you don't do that, and that's really turning to me and doing the works you did before, that's repenting. But if you don't do that, I'll come to you. <laughs> you know, when your dad gets home, <laughs> right? That's what's happening here. He's like, I'm giving you the opportunity to come to me. But if I come to you, it's not going to be good. He says, if you don't, I'll come to you. And I'll remove your lampstand from its place amongst the churches. Affections can shift, loved ones. And when there was a deep love for Jesus and going after him and bragging on him and boasting on him, it can shift and don't be deceived. And if that's happened, we need to remember where you were, turn back, and then replace this newfound passion with this stuff, with this first love. Of Jesus Christ. We need some of that in the church, for sure. And now I want to say something about this lampstand. The lampstand, like I grew up in Temple. 
So I'm a Jewish kid. I went to temple every week. And uh, see where that cross is right there? We had, um, we had a light. And it was a representative of the lampstand that would be in the tabernacle and in the old temple. And the, lamp, the, the light, the, um, they called the eternal light. And it was never to go out. They used to use it. That's the, that's the miracle of Hanukkah. Remember the miracle of Hanukkah? Was the, it only had enough oil. They didn't have light bulbs back then. They had oil, right? They only had enough oil for a day, but it lasted for the whole week. Like That's what Hanukkah is, right? And so this thing was called the eternal light. And the eternal light represented God's presence. And Jesus is saying, listen, if you keep pursuing this stuff and not me, I'll remove my presence from you. Didn't David say that? Please don't take your presence from me. Very, very dangerous. So the last point. The narrow gate is definitely Jesus Christ, John 10, 9. But you can't, here's the, here's the thing you got to, and this is, this is highly controversial, but just bear with me, and I only ask you to go back and check the scriptures. The gate is Jesus Christ. But you can't simply brush 1 John 2.17 under the rug and ignore it. I'm only going to ask you to do something with this thing, okay? And don't say it only means that you have to accept Jesus. Here's what it says, 2.17. And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave, but anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. Now, if, listen, (laughs) this flies in the face of the people say by faith alone, grace alone. I get it. I get it. I get it. I get it. You've been saved by grace alone, by faith alone, which is foolish because that's two things. You can't say alone, but that's a whole other story. You can't sweep these words under the rug and just simply say, what he's trying to say is that you have to accept Jesus to live forever. No. He says, anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. Okay? Um, some translations will say, but whoever does what pleases God uh, remains forever. Some translations would say uh, a synonym, which is abides forever. Uh, it doesn't say those who abide in him will do the will of God. That is, it, we don't need to switch, we don't need to do this to scripture. Okay? That's what happened in the garden. That's what got us off course to begin with. Okay? The Bible says that whoever does what pleases God will abide forever, will live forever, will remain. Okay? Remain in Christ. That's where he's talking about. When he says abide, when he says remain, it's in, you're in Christ. Okay? Only those who do what pleases God will remain in Christ. This, this twisting of Scripture to fit our false construct of theology is common. Right? Here's, here's another, just a little, a little tidbit for you. Matthew 24, 13. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Right? That's what it says, right? So that's a direct quote from the Bible. The, but... The one who endures to the end will be saved. And what's commonly, most commonly taught is that if someone is truly saved, they'll stay saved till the end because a real saved person is so changed that they can't and they don't know how to go back. But the Bible says, but the one who endures to the end will be saved, right? How about just going with what is written? Why can't we just do that in the church and just get away from denominational bents and have, we have been given the mind of Christ, we've been given the Holy Spirit of Christ, and we've been given the Word of Christ, and why can't we just, just obey and believe what is written? You can't just brush this stuff off to fit some some theological construct that someone gave you, and so they twist the scripture and say what he meant to say was, Jesus doesn't need help with describing what his thoughts are. 
He's perfectly clear when he says the one who endures to the end will be saved. He's perfectly clear when he says, but whoever does what pleases God will abide forever. Like, that's in there and we can't ignore it, okay? So, in this text, 2.17, the word is clearly teaching us that to remain where you are in Christ, you have to obey There's obedience. There's a call to obedience to God's people. It's not a, I got saved and I can do whatever, but just as you accepted Christ, acknowledgement of salvation, so you must continue to follow him. It's all throughout the Bible. It doesn't go away and we can't ignore it. So do you want to know if you have eternal life? Here's deep. You hate anyone? That's it. That's how you know. A coworker? A boss? A parent? An ex? A politician? A neighbor? Whatever the circumstance. Have you forgiven that person? And so moved from death to life? Or have you not? So how about your hate? And how about your love? Come on up, Tom. How about your love? Who or what is your love flowing fastest and first to? Is it to his stuff or is it to him? So do you love people and love God or what they provide for you? That's how we know if we have everlasting life. Let's pray. Father, I, uh, I thank you for the privilege, and it is a privilege, to stand here and to proclaim, to herald your news. It's an honor. It's a privilege. And Lord, I, could, I would only ask that you'd help me to uh, be accurate and to be clear. Years ago, Lord, you entrusted to me a ministry that would challenge the status quo, that would challenge what is widely accepted and taught in churches if it was contradicting what your Bible says. And I know that doesn't make friends with the establishment. Lord, I don't want to be right. I just want to be effective. And so, Father, I would pray that any feelings of strife or contention or division that what I'm teaching could cause, I pray that you'd send that back to hell where it belongs. You said, let there be no division in the church, but to live in harmony with one another. And that means that we should be able to come together and circle our wagons around Jesus Christ and his word. And even if we disagree, what we would all do is just take the notes we've taken and lay the scriptures over them. To do as the Bereans did. To check what Moses, what I say, check it against the scriptures. We'll see if that's what it says. And then help us to adjust our thinking and adjust our relationship with you based on your word, not on our feelings not on our theological commitments and our doctrinal groupings and all that. Let us base our belief system on your word. Lord, that includes me. And I think I'm right, but that doesn't matter what I think. Open up our eyes to truth. Help 
us to see you for who you really are. I've come to realize, Lord, that just because a certain thing's been preached and taught for a long time, that doesn't necessarily mean it's true. Your word is true. You're true. You do not change. Lord, I thank you for every person that's here tonight. And you know, I have a deep desire to share you with everyone. And I know there's people in this room right now that feel the same way. Help us with that. We only want to please you. We want to serve you. Loved ones, I'm not going to pass the basket around tonight. I'm just going to ask you to pray. And if you feel so led by God's Holy Spirit to 